once the side by share it. And I love this because I've learned, like I say, from Harry as well, that while I can see it saying it's setting up and you've got the little, what we call the little blue caterpillar, mm -hmm. um, it was already live. <laughs> And I'd realised like the very first post I think that I did with Harry, um, I'm like putting my lipstick on or something. And then he's like, no, we're already live. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Everyone's watching you. <laughs> right, share so, to a page. We should to a page. be here. Push. There you go, that so, should be shared as well. La da da, la da dee dee. If there's anyone here already, I'm just trying to figure out where we are on Facebook. There we go. Do, do, do. And then in a second, I'll get past us. That's the only thing. If you ever watch it, do you, are you going to watch it on Facebook as well? Uh, I'll have it on my phone, yeah. Yeah. And then it's, yeah, it's in the Turn past. past. It's weird, us isn't it? Off. Okay, I've turned past off, us off. <laughs> Okay, right. We already have 11 people. Awesome. Nobody's speaking. We're just 13 me. people coming in. Nice. Harry's there. <laughs> who's, who's posting as Academy? Is that Harry or is that Jessica? Hello, Roberta. 17 people, all we're getting then, nice. We'll do proper little intro with people in a second. 19. This is like uh, waiting for a price fund to go off, isn't it? <laughs> and it's also the fact that everything's in the past. So I know, it's bizarre, isn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Hello, Kirsty. When you're trying to track comments as well, and it's obviously everyone's commenting in their real time but we're already the conversation's already moved on by, by the time we kind of get to there yeah which is why it's quite nice to have somebody i think so harry's in yeah. the comment section so he can oh okay it's harry so i asked who's posting as academy in the comments and it says my has an urtism which means it's harry <laughs> 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 okay so for the the 23 people who are, who are here already um i am dr chloe farahar and i we are posting via academy and i am being joined by kieran rose and my cat, and the cat. <laughs> really come on down you get down you get I'm trying to be professional here right um so i'm being i'm joined by kieran rose um who is also known as the autistic advocate um and today we are talking about um basically what it's like to discover your autistic identity um because you've become a parent and then your children um end up getting diagnosed um so i think there's quite a few people 20 odd people in here now which is nice lovely okay bad. um we'll see how this goes because yeah yesterday's was quite amusing because it was two pdas um having a conversation and it it, it kind of descended into um, um mayhem towards the end um but what i was trying to do was harry and i i have some very very basic questions and Harry asked the same questions of Joe Richardson yesterday. So I was kind of seeing if we could have a comparison. But I think the comparisons will be quite amusing considering like how it descended yesterday. <laughs> um, we can guarantee it does descend into chaos today and then you can compare the two. This is true. And you, I, I won't get you to say it, but um, do you, did you not say you have a bet on about <laughs> not bringing up a certain yeah. topic? Yeah, so, some, somebody's actually put money on me bringing up a certain topic within the first five minutes of this live so how, how long are we in at the moment <laughs> uh, <laughs> not not long not um long. <laughs> well i was just thinking you could call it something else because in the literature I could, yes yes i could actually so, i could technically get around it but could be sneaky there sneaky. <laughs> okay um are you all right to just jump in yeah is that all right yeah of so course, um yeah. 
like I say, so yeah, basically we're talking about um, parents who realise their autistic identities because of their own um, children being diagnosed or discovering that their um, children mm -hmm. are also autistic. Um, and we've kind of done these ones because we had a number of followers who brought that up as a topic they were interested in. Mm -hmm. So I think largely people were asking because they weren't diagnosed yet. So it was quite an right. interesting thing. They wanted to see what that kind of thought process yeah, was. And yeah, and not being parents ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so Harry and I both um, don't have children. Um, yeah, we thought we'll find some, some uh, autistic educators who are parents. Okay. So my very straightforward first question is, how did you discover you were autistic? Well, actually, I'm going to scuffle all your plans because <clears throat> I did it the wrong way around. Ah. <laughs> I was an adult when I was diagnosed, but I did not yet have children at that point. Um, although there is context to that, which will actually fit in kind of what you, the, the, the narrative that you kind of want to go down to. Um, I was 23 um, when I was diagnosed, which was several years ago shall we say <laughs> <laughs> it, it was quite quite a long time ago <laughs> it was 2003 and um so uh that point i had gone through obviously all the experiences that most autistic people go through when they're undiagnosed you know you're in the school and stuff like that and the bullying and feeling like an outcast and and the the bloopers rule would be amazing from kind of my backstory of growing up as a teenager and all of those kind of things. And my eldest nephew was diagnosed. So it was kind of crosses out and wasn't my children, but it was my sister's son. Um, and he was also ADHD and he literally came out of my sister running and didn't sleep for the first three years of his life. It was like, you know, back then. And then um, I happened to pick up a book and I cannot tell you who it was by. It might have been one of Tony Atwood's books, but we'll not say his name out loud because I don't like Tony Atwood very much. <laughs> but, um, and in the back was basically the diagnostic criteria. There were the, the questions that are in the, uh, the, the AQA, the AQA. And I was sitting going through it and I was going, mm, it feels a bit like me. That feels a bit like me as well. That feels a bit like me. And I got to the bottom of this list and checked the kind of score and had scored pretty much 100%. And then at that point, I gave the book to my sister, my oldest sister, who's very much like me. And she went through it and she came out with the same score. And we kind of looked at each other and we're just, nah. But my mum got really excited because my mum, she loved a campaign back then. And that we, we realised now she was undiagnosed autistic. She is undiagnosed autistic. And so this was like, bing, all the lights went off in her head. Um, so she literally marched us down to the doctors the next day and asked for a referral to the uh, to Simon Baron Cohn's clinic in Cambridge. Um, and at that point, because there were very few adult autistics being diagnosed at that point, they would take people from anywhere in the country. Um, and about three months later, I spent the whole day with Simon Baron Cohen um, in his office. Wasn't Interesting. I'm going to make a note about that. I'm going to Go ask on. you more about that in a minute. Okay. Um, so, and it wasn't it wasn't a diagnosis as people would get a diagnosis now, you know, it wasn't the official let's go through and ask these questions and stuff. It was more conversational. We, I literally spent the whole day talking to him and um, came out with the end of it with an Asperger's diagnosis, which now retrospectively looking back and knowing what I know about my early childhood, actually that was the wrong diagnosis. I should have got an autism diagnosis as it was back then, you know, the separation. Even back so, then. Yeah. Because um, although I spoke early actually i was hyperlexic i've got a diagnosis of hyperlexia obviously looking back a retrospective diagnosis of hyperlexia so actually that masked the fact that i wouldn't speak for days at a time i would literally go four five six days sometimes without speaking might have a conversation with someone and then would disappear again it might be one or two words and then that was it and nobody in my household thought this was abnormal so retrospectively looking back i actually fit that criteria better than i did the asperger's criteria can you just define hy mm -hmm. hyperlexia for us? Sure. So hyperlexia is the ability to use vocabulary, read, uh, read um, at an adult level at a very, very early age, usually pre five. So um, I don't know. I read I read Lord of the Rings when I was six. That was, that you know, so so that that's kind of if you have a child who 
shows things like that, uses vocabulary you wouldn't expect them to use at that age and and maybe has and uses it in context as well. That's the important thing, not just blurting out words, but literally using that in the right context. Then usually it's hyperlexia going on. And I think that's why partly why the Asperger's diagnosis was created, because I think a lot of a lot of people who are who have that diagnosis are hyperlexic and it kind of masks the other stuff. Mark, so, yeah. Mark, the other things that you might have struggled with struggled with would yeah. have picked you up as autistic absolutely and so if i get that right then that was following your nephew getting diagnosed that was following my nephew's path yeah so <laughs> i got that diagnosis and you know 2003 we were still on dial up um for the internet and um the only adult autistic in the world at that time was temple grandin um, who I didn't associate with at all, didn't identify with at all in any way, shape or form, and didn't really know what to do with it, didn't mean anything to me, all the literature was about children, um, I wasn't aware, You're know, looking back now, it breaks my heart knowing that there were autistic advocates back then battling away and I didn't know about them, um, and battling away on the internet as well, and I didn't know about them as well, um, so I parked my diagnosis for 10 years, and didn't explore it and just carried on going through the same cycles of burnout, hitting the same walls, hitting the same challenges, didn't understand why those things were happening because I had no context and nowhere to look for that context. Um, so it wasn't until my first son was born that, I mean, he was literally born, handed to me and my wife was carted off to theatre for four hours and I was left holding this baby at two o'clock in the morning, didn't <laughs> hadn't, hadn't held a baby for a very long time didn't really know what to do with him and he sat and stared at me for four hours didn't cry he just eyeballed me for that whole time but it was like we had this telepathic conversation going on and I just knew that he was like me and at that point I realized you know as a newborn baby as a newborn baby I just I knew I absolutely knew it just sang to me out of him it was like he was telling me and at that point, I realised how much I was struggling, that there was no way I was ready to be a father and wasn't capable of being a father if I didn't understand myself nor could support myself. And that's what sparked off me kind of just literally going out and I went on Facebook. I'd never had a Facebook account. And I thought I'll go on Facebook and see what's there and typed in the word Asperger's and kind of fell into the the Aspie groups, you know, the, the, the kind of those groups as they were even back then. Um, and this is 2013 this was about 2013 yeah so um went into those uh went into those groups and still didn't fit still didn't sing right to me the things that they were saying and and i realized now are we five minutes in yeah i can say it now i'm brave enough now um i realized now looking back that i was in groups full of people who were still although they had a diagnosis were still masking furiously and didn't understand that they were masking um, and thought that their lives were their lives because of this horrible thing that they had and all of this kind of stuff. And it wasn't until actually I came across the Facebook group Autistics Worldwide and wandered into there and started seeing all these narratives that I had already, I'd already come up with these narratives in my head, I already had an understanding of what was happening, but didn't have words like neurodiversity. I didn't, I didn't have that word to put to what I was already thinking. And all these concepts just suddenly started popping out at me and it just, everything just fell into place and it all made sense. And I think, and like you say, it's been over five minutes. So I hopefully you've won that bet now um, <laughs> about, somebody nick king has put bingo so i don't know if that's the person no, no she wasn't okay. her, but she knows what i'm talking about <laughs> okay um i mean that because that is quite an interesting thing in and of itself isn't it is that how late researchers and diagnosticians and things are to the party yeah. when it comes to understanding masking and camouflaging and yeah because we see that still when when you we have autistics come to our support program and even though they're with all other autistic people they are heavily masking and they yeah. feel like they still don't fit in yeah and that's because they've not it's acknowledged not their mask yeah. and yeah. and dropped that mask so that's yeah. really that is I, I i understand that your friend wanted to put that bet on <laughs> but it's such a huge and important thing it is and it is. like you said that's like 10 years of you still 
masking i guess and still hurting myself that's what i was doing effectively and that that's effectively you know it, it is a i mean you know masking masking mask if i've got a special interest it's masking and <laughs> you know that and it, it's kind of, that's why people put bets on me saying it um but um it's it, it's self-harm it really is self-harm but at the same time it's a defense mechanism and it's a needed defense mechanism so you have this it's a trauma response you are your is your brain literally reacting to trauma um and people talk about this concept of kind of you know i can research at the moment is talking about masking as just a social strategy that you pick up put on walk into a room and then take off when you leave the room and it isn't that at all but you know full and well it, it's a whole life enveloping traumatic response to invalidation to bullying to victimization to all of the things that go on around us all the things we all experience as autistic people growing up whether we have a diagnosis or not i hasten to say um the experiences are pretty much still the same and it is a response to that and that's that's what i carried on doing after having my diagnosis and just and so i was still going through burnout i was still going through massive doses of suicidal ideation and suicide attempts as well and and all of these things because i didn't understand what was happening to me and because i didn't have that information to hand in order to be able to start introspecting and outrospecting as well you know learning about myself and others i didn't have that wasn't at my fingertips so i couldn't do anything about that so i just carried on as what was I my think normal that's why i dislike camouflaging as a yeah. as a term because it implies voluntary sort of sneakily trying to infiltrate that that's the yeah. kind of um that's what i hear when i hear camouflaging yeah. and and you're you're right it is definitely more than that and i and i teach that in a masking session as well mm. is that it typically is involuntary it's yeah. it's like you say it's a learnt um mechanism because of trial and error i made yeah. a mistake i got punished for it by being in a, a certain way obviously we would understand it now as an autistic yeah. way um so bit by bit you build up that, that mask. mask yeah. yeah and um yeah i think that's i i really yeah sometimes with the literature i do struggle with it because yeah. it does imply and, and i think voluntary... because they're missing out on the whole kind of psych i mean it's psychology isn't it it's very uh self-centered and kind of self-focused and it doesn't usually draw on other fields and i think that's part of the problem because it sociology plays a huge part in this as well um and then I've we've got a, I've, I have a paper in preprint at the moment with um, Dr. Amy Pearson from Sunderland, um, literally about this, and it, it's an overview of the masking narrative and where we think it should go and what we think is missing from it as well, um, <clears throat> and it's very much wrapped around kind of gender at the minute as well because that's one of the biggest narratives around masking as well is this whole concept of this female autism phenotype which is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> But that narrative is taking off as well, which is really, really hard. So this is why we've that, done but this. But that's what's frustrating is that by the time that the research is starting to talk about female autistics, uh -huh. well, actually, they don't talk about female autistics. They talk they about talk female about autism. Autistics. Yeah. But there is no such thing as female. No. I want to be quite clear. Anyone who's watching, there's no such thing as female autism or male autism. You have female autistics, male autistics, non-binary autistics, trans yeah. autistics. It's it's not a gendered thing um and but the that is that, where they're pushing that narrative though isn't it and that's yeah. the difficult and that's the problem is that they're already behind yeah by now talking about female autism they're already behind what the autistic community and autistic researchers who are interested in autistic yeah. experience and research as well um there, oh, sorry, I'm going to have to get rid of the comments section because it distracts me. I'm not even reading them because <laughs> it pings up and distracts we'll me. We'll look at those in a minute. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine because Harry's Harry's um, monitoring it, so it's not even like I need it. It's just it okay. pings and yeah, um, yeah. So they're already behind what the autistic community and autistic research is already knowing, which is that it's not a gendered thing no. um, and things like this. So yeah, right, okay. Back to my question. <laughs> On, what was the question i've forgotten i know well, it was how did you discover you're autistic and that was it was a fascinating and and well articulated um, description of how you got here i've probably um, answered all your questions to be honest you might I have, have i have a tendency to do that well yeah because my next one was, was what was the process of realizing i said as relates to their children getting diagnosed but like you say i that was a really i i'm assuming you've spoken about this 
before because that was a really beautiful way of explaining as well in terms of your um baby boy and um yeah just kind of seeing yourself I guess that autistic yeah I mean I I think it I think it was that I think it was partly it was seeing myself reflected back and it wasn't that I was looking for it because even at that point you know like I said I, I had no real understanding of what it meant to be autistic or any of the kind of anything around it I didn't didn't really understand that it was although I like my family now I know my family's full of autistic people and even then although my sister was diagnosed at the same time as me I still had no real understanding that this was something that was passed on from parent to child kind of thing um so it was kind of I had no forward planning that I was going to have autistic children I had no concept that that was going to happen so for this boy to be looking at me (laughs) <laughs> like literally I mean if he'd had it was like like you know if you imagine Superman as a baby with laser eyes it was like that boring into my skull and it was kind of like it was he was telling me I am like you that's the message that I got from it and and that was such a trigger for me it was such an important moment. and it, it's it's I could go back and I could talk you through those four hours minute by minute by minute by minute um, literally because I remember it so vividly and it was it was it was life-changing so that was so, so was it kind of like I know you said that it was because you weren't ready how did you word it like you weren't ready to be a dad if you weren't understanding of your autistic self yeah not that you weren't ready to be a dad no no, no no I was I was ready to be a dad but I knew that I could not fully support my son in the right way without being able to support myself properly and understand myself properly because you know I knew at that point the moment like this message came into my head you know I am like you I thought but I don't even know who I am so how can you be like me and then how can I help how can I help you be you if I don't know who I am and so it was this and I had this 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 whole moment of turmoil I I got thrown out of the hospital but like it was about five o'clock in the morning and um and I remember sitting in the taxi on the way home thinking I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And it wasn't that I didn't know how to look after a baby. And I didn't know, you know, that I can change nappies and feed and all of these kind of things. And and I I loved him in that moment. I knew that. And it wasn't that. I wasn't doubting that. It was literally, I don't know what to do to sort myself out. And that that was kind of, you know, which is not the thing you should be thinking about once you've just had a child. It was like panicking about myself. But But that makes sense, though, because you want to be able to... No, that really does make sense, though. Like, you need to know yourself. And then if your child is like you, then you will have that knowledge and understanding yeah. to impart on your child. So what what did you do then? So what was your I, process of figuring out who you were? <laughs> I bought every book on autism that I could possibly get my hands on. And I mean, I still do that now. I've, I've read literally everything that's ever been written on autism um oh very quick plug actually because on your um the autistic advocate website Mm -hmm. you have got a good you're starting to compile decent yeah on autistic experience yeah which is really important so i try to like pin people to that page because it's very easy to read bad narratives yeah it is and things that don't understand autistic experience at all so yeah Mm -hmm. if anyone really wants to know decent books to read have a look at the autistic advocates website on you've got a page of a new I've got a re- yeah i've got a resource i've got a resource on the reading section. list yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. sorry thank you no that's okay so yeah um, still reading everything you can yeah about. yeah so so then i was I, I literally read everything that i possibly could and nothing fit nothing made sense to me it didn't answer any of my questions it didn't kind of uh, there was no spark if that makes sense um and it wasn't like I was reading about myself. It was all very, I was dissociating from it because it wasn't about me. Um, and that's kind of when I got to the point and I realised all of these books are written by professionals. They're written by parents. Some of them have been written by autistic people, but I really don't identify with what they're saying. Like I identify with the experiences maybe, but not their internal thought process and stuff like that. Um and it actually made me doubt myself. It made me like, it was like, why have I got this diagnosis? Because this this isn't none of these people are like me, um, or they're not talking about me at least. And like I said, that was at that point. Then I realised that my only avenue was to maybe find real autistic people, as opposed to finding a textbook autistic person. 
and that's what I did. So I, like, as I said, I went in, I went and joined on Facebook uh, a lot of groups that were about Aspergers. And looking back now, there were a lot of what we would maybe term Ashby supremacists um, within that. Um, a lot of not Aspie supremacists, a lot of people who had that diagnosis that were kind of stumbling around in the dark, very obviously, like I was. Um, but a lot of people that were very, we're not like them. We don't want to be like them. We separate ourselves from them. And I watched numerous people with an autism diagnosis and not an Asperger's diagnosis come into these groups and be torn to pieces and leave very, very quickly. And it horrified me, absolutely mm -hmm. horrified me. So I started searching for autism instead of Asperger's. And then it opened up this whole new world where actually people were in these groups that had a diagnosis of one or the other and they were accepted and they were coming in and they were having these discussions and realizing that there was no difference between the two absolutely no difference at all so then i started looking for writing by autistic people um, and very quickly kind of fell in the autistic narrative rather than the Asperger's narrative. I realized that I did my own research. I knew a lot of what was in Neurotribes before Neurotribes was kind of written as much as I could anyway. And just kind of autism, I just fell into this autism hole. Um, but it was an autism hole that was being filled up by autistic people rather than professionals and all these other voices that were just not me. And then there kind of just like I said just the, all these narratives all these I had these concepts in my head but I didn't have these labels and these names for them and it coming into these coming into this world gave me these labels and these names for things that I'd already kind of figured out myself I was quite disappointed because I kept thought I was coming up with all these brilliant ideas and other people had already got there before me but it but just goes that, to, that's quite validating at the same time it's at the same time yeah. yeah it's you kind of yeah it, yeah. It's also because I did kind of similar things like I, ha I had very different ways of understanding mental health. Mm. Um, and then I came across neurodiversity in like 2011 and started talking about it before I knew I was even autistic. Kind of if you get drawn you do. To, the, to the narratives and things. And, and I was like, right, I had these ideas and then people were, were writing about it, but they had a language for me. Yeah they start, you know, I mean, there wasn't much in terms of the language of neurodiversity in not that was that accessible to me anyway, in 2011, 2012. And we've got a much bigger language now, which means we can articulate our experiences. Yeah, so I'm trying to is... think of the very big difference between what you would have been able to access in 2003 and 2013. And now obviously 2020, like the differences must be shocking yeah and i mean when the biggest the biggest kind of books that were around at the time i mean uh atwood had just his book had only recently come out um much of the narrative was wrapped around simon baron cohen and um uh the extreme male brain and all of that kind of stuff which you know intuitively i just knew it was wrong it just felt right it felt creepy to be honest um and it was still very much in excuse the pun, in the wake of Andrew Wakefield as well, you know, we're only talking five years later. Um, and I had seen my mum and my sisters kind of go down these avenues of MMR and all of this kind of stuff. I mean, I found, I found my mum, I was helping uh, clear out my mum's flat a few months ago, about six months ago, and she had, she had quite a few old autism textbooks there, and I was flicking through them. She had newspaper cuttings all about, it was like literally the, the newspaper cutting from the sun, um, the original one that when they first put the headline out about MMR and, uh, and autism and that was in there, you know, so it's, I had seen all these narratives and luckily had already been able to discard them as not being relevant to me. Um, so even, even though I didn't know what to do with this diagnosis nor what it meant to me, I still knew that none of that was right. So when I came into the right community, the community that gave me the answers that I need, I didn't have the trouble of going through all of these awful myths and things, or most of them anyway, because I had already kind of picked them up and put them to one side and carried on kind of thing. And it's, it's, I think, I think the way that I have done things is quite unique <laughs> in terms of, you know, like having that label, but still Lots going through the same, going through the same process that a newly diagnosed person would do, but a decade later. Well, lots of trial and error. And yeah. I think that's what's, I think it will hopefully be getting easier. I, the difficulty I see is that 
as many actually autistic fantastic groups and things pop up you're going to have 10 negative narratives yeah. pop up at the same time so it's yeah. it's about desperately trying to find those newly discovered autistics ahead of them internalized in that negative absolutely. negative absolutely. narrative um, and I, th I think also i mean with that point as well when someone is newly diagnosed because the mask is still there and the mask is very much usually still in control of the person rather than the other way around it's very easy to kind of lean into these stereotypes and lean into these myths because it's kind of you know when you see people who say um i don't know sheldon cooper i identify completely with sheldon cooper he's exactly like me it's like no he's not as a stereotype he's not exactly like you you are your own person he's a very very he's a made up character but because he has these stereotypes that's easy to lean into then you take on that persona to a degree and that that's that's kind of where the whole the aspie narrative the old aspie narrative comes from it's people leaning into a diagnosis that they're given because that's the closest thing that fits what they feel and what they identify with when in actual fact that label is kind of meaningless and that criteria for that is kind of meaningless because you are your own person and you have your own identity and you have your own things that feed into that identity but i think when you are Taking hard on mask. yeah you when you are hard masking it's literally sucking in that information and presenting it because you are told that's what you are so therefore you are it and it, it's it's really really and this this is this is where amy and i've gone with that see i've gone back to masking and i always do this this is where amy and i have gone have gone with the piece that's that's coming being published soon hopefully in the we've actually associated it with um have you heard of uh, w.e.b du bois he was a sociologist back in the early 19th uh, the early 20th century he was a black sociologist in the oh, states yeah, 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 yeah. and um he talked about double consciousness so if you are a black person and you live you know under victimization racist racist victimization then you end up presenting a version of yourself that is not yourself so you have this person that's underneath and then this outward person that has to be there all the time to protect the person underneath and effectively it's the same thing and then at what some point it becomes a kind of you dissociate from that second consciousness that consciousness takes over and the real you that's under there is still existing and still living and breathing but it's like they're locked in a box and then the, the second consciousness is the one that's in charge and it very very much fits with the autistic masking narrative there's so many parallels and that's not to say that an autistic person suffers the, the same obviously injustice that a black person would because it's completely different in terms of that but the experience of what you feel from that can actually be very very similar and relatable and it, it's and again the masking narrative this is what's missing from the masking narrative that it's not a conscious thing that you do it's something that maybe when you are very young and as a child you are actively making these mistakes and learning from them but it very very quickly doesn't become something that you do it becomes something that your subconscious makes you do and there's no I it's an illusion so of choice hard to get that through to people that it's yeah. not a conscious thing no. and not and i mean that's i've i've spoken about that before about how i didn't even know what my mask looked like to other yeah. people all i knew was what was being reflected back at me which was that i was i was described as cold unapproachable yeah. standoffish all these kinds of things which made no sense to me and so that mask obviously was to protect me because if yeah. I look cold, unapproachable, people aren't going to come near me, aren't going to exactly. harm me. Yeah. Um, but also that mask didn't make sense mm. because I didn't know that I was doing it. I didn't know how I was doing it, what it looked like. And yeah. so breaking that down is quite hard, especially like say later in life. It is, it is. And then, and I mean, obviously to, to bring it back to why we're talking today, it's kind of for any person that's kind of looking to explore their autistic self and their autistic identity a lot of people who are late diagnosed are fearful that once they realize that they are masking that underneath it's just a void there's no person underneath and that's a real fear for lots and lots of people that once they pick apart you know once they, they are able to separate their real self from this masking self that the real self has no value it has no worth it has no that there's nothing there it's just an empty shell on it and it, it's so wrong because the mask is a projection of you it is fundamentally part of who you are it's your your characteristics and your personality in a presented in a different way so there isn't that there is this void but i think it's really really important and that's again that's something that 
when you have, there's no po po obviously there's no real post diagnostic support but even the post diagnostic support that does exist in bits and pieces that's not something you would ever get from any kind of council run social group or you know th there's there's a real lack of real education there because because they don't know because they're relying on research which is running 15 years behind us and i know a shameless little plug is that yeah which nobody i think you know who's who's likely to be watching now will be able to help with but you know annette and i are desperately wanting funding to expand our so your autistic program because that's our pre and post diagnostic support program and it's autistic run it's eight weeks um and that the majority of it is about helping older when i say older we, we could be talking about adolescents as well just yeah. um, and we could support children but our point being is it is about breaking down the mask it's about allowing people to be in a space where they're not judged and that they can just be with people who can actually understand them and we get so many of them come that feel like imposters they feel like you know and that again is about the mask yeah. and um and we've got maskers who will be 18 and we've got maskers who've been in their 50s and it takes quite a few of those it takes it takes about four weeks so that's eight hours with us before they'll start to really even mm. be aware of the mask we help them try to be aware of it and start to break it down um but yeah so we we if i won the lottery i would just do it anyway do you know what i mean i, I this is I the thing having to rely well. on funders <clears throat> to fund research like this which this is what would help this is what helps our well-being which is what you obviously are all about and champion mm. um championing which is that a word yes it is yeah. um which is you know the importance of breaking the mask down and helping that person be in a, a safe space to do that yeah. with other people. My argument is that's the best thing for well-being. Mm -hmm. um, I'd agree. I'm going to go back to my questions. Yeah, go on. I, I'd say, <laughs> I've sent the, 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 although although you are not Harry, I've sent you on a completely wrong tangent. Oh I? no, it's absolutely fine. It's fantastic. <laughs> I'm hoping I haven't really been paying attention to the comments. Uh, Harry, if you're still in the comments, if there's any questions that you think um that kieran and i should pick up could you pin them <clears> for us because i have not been paying attention to the comments but hopefully people are getting something um we could we could do a whole another session on just masking again we could i, mean, I could talk for days about it to be we honest. can do masking. i do <laughs> we can do masking definitely okay. um where have we got to uh, that was my first question by the way <laughs> sorry no absolutely <laughs> fine um so uh, my other question is just quite a straightforward one, hopefully, um, which is, do you have any other co-occurs? So oh, yeah. obviously yesterday we had Joe, who's um, autistic as well as PDA. Yes. And a number of other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> I've already talked about hyperlexia. Um, uh, I'm selectively mute, um, which uh, is an anxiety condition, uh, which means I get in certain situations. And it's different from autistic verbal shutdown and um, I will get in certain situations and I will want to be able to talk but the words get stuck here rather than having the autistic blank mind I get that as well that can be interesting sometimes when the two of those are interplaying with each other <clears throat> um, um, which is uh, quite problematic when one of your roles is also as a public speaker and as a trainer <laughs> that can be in, that can be fun and um, I suspect I am ADHD although I've never actually explored it that deeply but I think I am um, I am medicated I take uh, uh, Pogablin for anxiety and I am Alex Thymic I am diagnosed CPTSD oh um, sorry two seconds so um Kieran just mentioned elixithymic, which is mm -hmm. um, a difficulty or inability to recognise emotions either in yourself or other people. Yeah, um, and then the ability to be able to verbalise those yeah. as well. And that yeah. can be um, different extents for different mm -hmm. people. So I just like, just in case there's people that don't know <laughs> these things. And sorry, that last one was PTSD. Yeah, CPTSD. And so, PTSD. yeah, so it's kind of, um, I have, uh, there, I've got other, um, you know, it's it's trying to figure out which is a co-incurring condition and which is just, a thing um and that's always the kind of thing because i you know i could say executive function um although i'm not pda i do get extreme demand avoidance sometimes and it, it's 
but you know generally i've got the kind of the the bracket of things that most autistic people kind of have and it, it's but it's really one thing that's really important to me is that those things are never things that are explored with autistic people it's usually something you have to figure out yourself along the way um like alex thymia is a perfect example in that nobody has ever heard of it and nobody knows what it is and especially professionals it's really terrifying how many professionals and have i never think heard that i think the research and um clinical communities don't actually understand how prevalent it is no within no. our community <clears throat> Um, I mean, current estimations are it's 50 percent but obviously there are issues there around that's 50 percent of the people that they spoke to you need to be able to recognize that you are alex thymic in order to say that you have alex thymia and you know so there, there's so many complications around it but i would hazard that it is a thing that probably every autistic person in some degree some capacity, struggles with yeah. because it fluctuates as well it's very very like most things you know it can be it can be worse from minute, it can change from minute to minute. It can be, you know, one day I can be absolutely fine. No, can be in complete contact with my body the next day. I haven't got a clue what I'm feeling. And, and it, it can, for those of you, again, bring it back to kind of the point. If you are someone who's in a relationship and you don't understand that's something that's going on with you, that can cause massive relationship problems when, you know, you can be accused of being unfeeling. Um, it can come across as quite gaslighty sometimes as well, because, so many times my wife will come up to me and she'll she'll take one look at me and she'll say what's going on and i'm like i'm fine i'm fine i'm fine and i will probably be really grump i'll be coming across as really grumpy and i'll probably be stomping around i'll be muttering under my breath all of those kind of things and i'll have no awareness right, that i'm doing yeah. this because i feel fine i'm absolutely fine because i've got nothing telling me that there is anything wrong three days later i'll be like oh yes yeah, so that's what that was that's why that's why michelle said that you know and it, it's it and that's a really different and if if my wife wasn't fully aware of that then the um, i mean like as we were kind of ex getting to know each other and we've been together we've been together slightly just before i got diagnosed actually um so it's kind of we've grown up together in that kind of regard so she knows me and she knows that that's that's kind of something that happens with me but for lots of people who don't, and especially, again, if you are a really furious masker and it's kind of something that you kind of press down and suppress, if you've got no attachment to what you're feeling at any given time, of course, the arguments that are going to come from that are going to be immense. So I would say I, I don't consider myself to be elixithymic. Yeah, I'm pretty Yeah, I'm pretty sure I don't consider myself to be elixithymic if I if I sort of investigate how I yeah. feel and, and this kind of thing. Whereas Louis, so my partner, who's autistic and uh, attention differences, um, yeah, he is because of, I, and I've said this before about how, what you just described, which is he basically has two emotions or what appears to have only two emotions, which is happy like a puppy <laughs> or really, really angry because he's gaming, right? That's it, just the two. There's nothing in between. Um, but, but there'll be some times when I'll see him and I'll and, and 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 kind of what you've just described maybe with your wife um seeing you where you kind of have you kind of can't come across grumpy you mm -hmm. may be lethargic more than you would normally be and and that would be a big thing for Louis because of because the attention differences is yeah. awake all the time and I'll say to him are you okay because and I'll explain what I can see and he'll go yeah no I'm fine and then maybe a day later mm -hmm. he'll go to me I thought about it. I think I'm upset about X, Y, Z. Yeah. But he is not aware. He's not no. capable of that ability, it, you know, doesn't yeah. have that ability. It is that complete disconnect between knowing your emotional state and actively knowing what's causing your emotional state. Um, and it's kind of, I really think, I strongly believe it's attached to trauma as well. Um, that it's something that you kind of, you learn to dissociate, to disconnect from your emotional state very very early on and i think it's when you are constantly going through those sensations of invalidation and you know your sensory needs are being dismissed and and that's a i mean is louis quite does he is he quite sensory averse to certain things uh i would say he's um hypo reactive to like tactile sensation mm -hmm. um yeah. but hypersensitive to sound and taste usually yeah so it's usually um, I've 
kind of figure that's usually people who have real extremes of things um so mine is touch i can't have people touch me at all um it, I can't. it actually i get i get burning sensations when people touch it hurts when people touch me um like skin to skin and even even if someone if i'm wearing clothes and someone put their hand on my shoulder i would I, the amount of people that i punched literally because that's my reflex to kind of someone's touch me and i'm just bang no get off um so i find i have anecdotally i found that it's people that tend to have real extremes in kind of sensory needs that that are kind of that alex thymus is really quite strongly present in um and like with that as well you know i'm i wear sunglasses all the time because I, I can't do light at all um and sound as well although randomly i'm partially lucky because i have many as disease which causes me, i'm partially deaf so it's sound on certain levels that used to really really bother me and really really hurt me actually don't hurt as well because i can't i can't hear them <laughs> so so i'm quite lucky in that regard yeah i was and i was smiling when you were saying about the sensation of being touched and stuff but not in a that that kind of looked like i was like yeah you don't yeah. like being touched but i it's meant more as of in, a nervous i grimace. know that i know that feeling <laughs> yeah that, and that's why i shake my head because of uh -huh. the, the the sensation of my hair was really distressing to me really um and which is quite difficult when you've got um i don't know if jessica is watching and i can't remember her description she says usually it's her and her mum have come up with this usually particularly if you've got neurodivergent people in a relationship you have a too far and a too close but you can't have as in somebody who's quite sensitive to a lot yeah. of things and then somebody who's sense seeking yeah. and it doesn't necessarily work if you have two too fars because they won't ever become get together um or two too closes because they'll just drive each other around the bend mm -hmm. um so i'm really tactile averse and louis tactile seat sense seeking and so sometimes it has to be on my terms like yeah. i'm like I don't know if he comes in and he wants to like love me and give me you know strokes and cuddles and all this and I'm like <laughs> no like kind of thing <laughs> not because I don't want them but because I wasn't prepared and yeah. and he gets so frustrated when he's doing the washing up and he's a big man he's like six foot three and he's doing the washing up and the water's going everywhere and I try to avoid him because if it if it touches me it's a surprise it's mm. um it's surprising um or unsuspected or unexpected rather sensory sensation that you weren't prepared for so yeah. if the if the and he's like it's just water and i'm like it might as well have been acid like it's, yeah anyway yeah. getting distracted again um, no 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 I, I completely i completely empathize with it because i'm exactly the same it's it's and that as well you know it's just something it's not just it really isn't just no it's unsolicited the, it is it's completely unsolicited but these are the things again that are missed with kids in terms of you know you send a child to school oh they're fine that's this you know no it's not it's not just it's because we bring our own bias to it don't we? we completely do because if it's okay for us we assume it's okay for other people we don't even think about it and that's our privilege in terms of that and it's i know and that's when i think of and then harry's talked about this before as well like when when you might have a child that looks really distressed because of clearly they're in auditory sensory pain yeah and everybody else will be like, oh, well, that's OK. You know, it, they, they're fine. The other yeah. kids are fine, blah, blah, blah. It's not it's that like, loud. Yeah. It's yeah. like, but your experience of the world is only one of many. Yes. How are you not? Yeah, it's very frustrating. It's too um, easy to dismiss. I just want to pick up on a pinned post. Um, I don't want to go into everything too much, but they've asked have you had any therapy or have your own coping strategies for the CPT CPTSD? Um, after diagnosis, when I was diagnosed, after diagno my autism diagnosis, uh, when I was diagnosed pretty soon after with CPTSD, um, and that was related to a lot of kind of childhood stuff and things that growing up, um, I went for therapy. I tried CPT, CPT talking therapy, you know, the usual kind of uh, gamut of things that you kind of try and it was all rubbish and didn't work a single thing for me particularly see uh, I can't speak today <laughs> cognitive behavioral therapy we'll call it that it's easy to say the longer words and um, particularly that um, because the frame of referencing was all wrong because it was putting the blame essentially in, in my anxiety around and my trauma around things 
that the therapist didn't see as relative mm -hmm. as traumatic because she wasn't autistic so yeah. she couldn't understand my frame of reference and that was so that no was, so yeah it's it's my coping mechanism with cptsd is actually um what i term outrospection which was self-exploration which is the introspection part but outrospection is learning about myself from other people and then applying those notions to myself so it was literally coming in that coming into the autistic community and being validated by other people's experiences and it's that i think autist i i pinpoint autistic culture as that moment when you go <gasps> that's me and that that that's autistic culture right there when you someone says something and a light bulb goes off in your head and it opens up all this series of doors and answers all these questions and just one aspect of yourself and that was the best therapy that i have ever had and that's why even as someone you know lots of people are autistic people are youtubers or have pages or whatever but you never actually see them in groups in the community and um, whether that's online or offline you never see them with like autistic people offline but you never really see them at the heart of thing now I have deliberately gone out of my way to set up support groups that I am active in myself. I am in groups that I am not running in, and I'm constantly around. And even if I'm not commenting, I'm reading and reading and reading furiously. And it, it's kind of because I need that, because I need that. That's that's my therapy is being around my people and being around people who have those shared experiences. And that's that's been the best thing that I could ever have done. And then and writing, I, writing became really cathartic. This is well. what I find fascinating as well, is that so many of us, in the autistic community end up on the same page like you said it's frustrating because you're like it feels like everybody's taken the idea that you had that was in your brain right and and yes yeah, so i'm you know i'm writing a chapter for an edited book on the importance of autistic um identity culture community and space mm. exactly what you're describing that and people are asking in the comments about positive autistic identity harry and i did a video which is on our page um in the shop on our page about how to foster a positive autistic identity and last um and what you said about cbt um i did a i've got a autistic well-being talk that i did and um, specifically about the issues with cbt because it's predicated on the idea that you have faulty thinking and that's what creates your anxiety yeah. whereas the majority of autistic anxiety is based on real tangible things and so you can't therapize it away it's no. about yeah those oh my god we could just talk forever i swear <laughs> it'd be amazing and we've completely gone away from parenting and what have well, you no, but, we, but we haven't we haven't though because I these know. are all these are all important concepts for people that are coming are new to this but also the people that are parenting and do have children because these are the things that their kids are going through and they'll have missed half of it they won't even realize that these are the things that their children even with the diagnosis the diagnosis isn't a magic answer it doesn't tell anybody anything and the people that don't get autism training are autistic people we are the only people that aren't ever told anything about autism it's left up to our parents or my SYA program and i want everybody to be able to do it <laughs> exactly but there's only, that's the thing there's a few only a few of us i will scoop as many autis as i possibly can to do the training so that they can deliver it as well and that's so important because it's this needs to come not only see this I'm, i might sound a little bit gatekeepery here because it's really important that this training comes from autistic people but oh, yeah. it has to be autistic people who are knowledgeable not just about themselves but about the narratives around autism and that's that's the key difference because it's kind of you know we're seeing this thing with the the nhs training at the moment i'm sure you've seen it all over yeah. twitter and things and it's like well autistic people are just making these decisions but it's are they autistic people that understand the narratives that are going on? Are they autistic people that understand why the National Autistic Society is hugely problematic? And, you know, and generally it's not. And that's that's the kind of problem. So the and, training like yours really needs to come from that source. And I know obviously it does coming from you. So and this is the argument that I keep having as well. And, and like I say, Harry and I have talked about we've done bloody videos. We're doing all sorts. Oh, that's my only swear I've ever done. <laughs> right. I do not swear. Um, <laughs> And it's the importance of it, it, it really doesn't matter who you are, mm. doesn't matter if you're autistic, a parent, doesn't matter. If you will not relinquish the culture of autism, so the negative narrative, the idea that we're a pathology, that yeah. we're 
vaccine injured, any of those sorts of things, if you will not relinquish that, it doesn't matter if you at your core believe that that's the truth. If we can tell you, show you, give you evidence, show you the research that it harms us, that it causes us CPTSD mm -hmm. and extreme mental harm and distress and psychological harm, that should be enough that you take on the neurodiversity narrative, the autistic culture narrative. Yeah. That's 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 all you need to know. So, I, you know, if, if you are a parent who I know parents love their kids, absolutely. Chuck out the culture of autism, goes in the bin and take on autistic culture and understand yeah. autistic culture. That will be the thing that improves your child's well-being and improves Absolutely. everything, their whole life exponentially. It will just improve. And, and that's why. So maybe at some point you and I and, and Harry and a number of other people can discuss because I'm all about applied. Everyone it is. It's great having conversations. Um, and also, it's really important that we give the practical knowledge of how to set those things up. Yeah. So you've already you already go and set up social groups and peer groups and go to them yourselves and stuff like that. We need to write a, a very basic idea of how to do that so that people can do it in yeah. their towns, if yeah. it's going to be online, something like that. So that's that's a new project if you're not already doing <laughs> that's it. That's a mission that we can do because that's what people need like you said it's sure. not enough to be an isolated because my argument is that the culture of autism isolates yeah that all that does when you are a person with autism is isolate you completely because why would you connect positively with anyone if you're just this pathology yeah so i've lost my train of thought oh no how do we get everyone to connect that's the point if you're that's just this isolated yeah. individual mm -hmm. yeah Right. So how do we do that? Um, how do I do SYA training? I need I need money. I need funding from the government, from research funders, anybody. I'm trying to do it now. Basically. You should set up so a crowdfunder. I know. And then there's the, my researcher side of me that's like, I need to demonstrate you need to objectively have so, yeah. it works and does what I want it to do. I mm -hmm. know it does what I want it to do. We've been doing it for two years, but. No, this is not about me. This is about Kieran. Right. <laughs> because it's already nine and I don't want to hold you up. That's okay. I'm not going anywhere, so that's fine. We can do more of these. This has been good. <laughs> um, where are we? So um, this one's an interesting one for parents, I think, as well. So what experiences or difficulties have you had as an autistic parent with autistic children? So like sensory clashes. Yeah. So the biggest one is obviously uh, what I said before about touch. So there have been two people in my life who can touch me without it burning. And one of them was my granddad who died when I was 14. And the other one is my wife. And that's one of the reasons why I married her. My children don't fall into that category, <laughs> but they are tactile and they need to be able to be tactile with me. So that's the point where I have to bite my fist when they clamber all over me, which they do. They want hugs. They want cuddles. They want to, they want to be all over me. They want to be, rubbling my hair because I've got stubbly hair and you know all of those kind of things so it's that's that is a point where that happens it's hugely overwhelming for me but I manage to mask it and suppress it at that moment and then it's usually at a point where I need to kind of go out in the garden and maybe scream for some time or roll around on the floor and just kind of get the the feeling it sounds it sounds it's kind of an icky feeling and it sounds horrible saying that about cuddling your kids, but it is a kind of nicky feeling, but kind of my love for them pushes through that, if that makes any kind of sense. And it, it's kind of, I guess it will be like, I don't know, to, you haven't got children, but you, you do have a cat. If your cat made you feel icky, you would still, you have a cat, you still, that cat deserves love from you and deserves your attention. So you have to give it. Um, there are other things as well in terms of uh, one of my biggest triggers is uh, small children screaming. <laughs> which is not fun when you have a parent when you're a parent of three small children um they're not small anymore the youngest is seven but um my my daughter um is a screamer and she still likes to scream and it's kind of her first instincts whenever anything goes wrong is to scream or a fly comes near her she screams and it, it's kind of so i think at some point i will probably end up on a kind of cardiac ward <laughs> in relation to that because it's kind of 
it feels like knives being put through your head. It absolutely feels like. And I'm being really negative, but it's really, really important to kind of go into parenthood as an autistic person with your eyes open. And also you can only parent if your needs are being met as well. You cannot parent if your needs aren't being met. Now with children, you cannot expect that they're going to stop doing what they're doing because it hurts you or it makes you uncomfortable or whatever level of kind of reaction you get to that. But you can over time, if you can bite, bite down on your fist and kind of bear with it, as they get older, they will learn to understand that there are things that you do that hurt them and there are things that they do that hurt you. And you can kind of mitigate that to a degree. So my boys, my two oldest, are at the point where they come and ask me if it's okay if they can have a hug rather than just coming and flinging themselves at me. Um, uh, my eldest son, um, he's very vocal with his stims and he knows that sometimes that triggers me. So he might warn me that he's going to stim or I will pick up on the cues and I will leave I will exit I'll go to a different room or he will go to his bedroom and stim up there while he's doing whatever it is he needs to do so it's kind of it's about meeting each other's needs as best you can and compromising as best you can because you can't all exist I mean there are five of us in, in our house and um, my wife isn't diagnosed my middle son isn't diagnosed but you know realistically all five of us kind of are we're neurodivergent at least shall we say so we all have competing needs and it's impossible to meet all everybody's needs. So we have to learn to compromise and kind of work around each other. And there is a point where your children will become old enough that hopefully they will recognize that you have needs as well. So it is about kind of that place, that time will come. But when they're little, it is very much about biting the bullet and kind of shoving it down inside you and going to a different room and screaming it out or punching it out into a cushion or whatever it is that you need to do. I mean, there's so many funny memes around, you know, like you've got parents that, you know, you can't even go to the toilet without your kids following you to the toilet sometimes. <laughs> it's like, especially me, because I'm kind of, I'm the person that cooks all the meals and like does all that kind of stuff. So they automatically, they will walk past their mum to come and find me. Even if I'm at the other end of the house, they will leave her and come and kind of get me. Um, so it's really hard for me to escape sometimes. It's really hard for me to get away from those small people that are triggering me all the time. So you just have to kind of, there is no easy answer, but you do have to, have to kind of work it out and stim it out as well. That's the other thing as well. Finding your stim and stimming to the end of furiously yeah. kind of getting it out. Because I've never, I've never wanted children. Right. And I've kind of in, it investigated that, you know, in my own head over the years, particularly before knowing I was autistic. I, I don't know how I would have explained at that point when I was younger, not knowing I was autistic, why I didn't want children. Mm. But I think it's a lot to do with the sensory. Yeah. Like not, I would not be able to manage. Um, you know, I loved my sister um, when we were growing up. It was just me and her. Yeah. But there were times in the night when she was breathing and I hadn't invest, I hadn't um, ever found earplugs. I didn't know about earplugs as a, as a child, like mm -hmm. a small child that she would end up with every single toy and pillow thrown at her just for breathing. She wasn't, you know, cause, cause I was obviously very yeah. auditory sensitive and I wear earplugs now. And even then it's still not enough a lot of the time. Um, yeah. So she would end up with everything and in, you know, death, death, you know, that's in my head. I was like, I just <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think it is interesting. I can't imagine having children I, I personally I know I yeah. wouldn't be able to manage so I really think it's amazing when you see autistic people where your clash you will clash with with the you, will. you, both, you have both to both. it's 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 impossible not to and that's that's that is it is the for me it is the hardest I mean aside from battles with schools and things like that you know the the, the common thing that happens when you have an autistic child I mean I go through those things as well I can advocate perfectly for them and me but I still go through the same battles that everybody else does. Um, but in terms of the sensory stuff, it is impossible for an autistic person to have an autistic child and for there not to be some kind of sensory clash because the, there is, it's kind of, it's almost like your children come out the opposite of you deliberately. Which is fascinating, <laughs> isn't it? It's literally your sensory profile sounds yeah. like they're, they're so the opposite. But I think also there's a, you know, um, 
uh, obviously uh, various people have periods. So when they live together within the same household, sometimes those periods align with each other and they go through the same, they go through their periods at the same time as other people. I think in terms of the century stuff, there, there, there comes a point where actually things do kind of start to align a little bit more. And, but I think that's more so because if you give your children the correct environment and you uh, enable them to kind of advocate for themselves and to understand themselves, then it gets to the point where they know how to regulate themselves very well. So I'm at a point now where I know that if someone, you know, if, if, if I'm going to do a stim that I know is going to irritate other people, I will go and do it somewhere where there aren't other people. Um, and that's not me masking. That's literally just me thinking about the needs of other people within that. And there is a point where children, if they are supported properly, will get to that point where they will realise that, you know, actually what I'm going to do is actually really going, really going to annoy my dad. So I'm not going to do it unless I'm going to wind him up deliberately. So I'm going to go somewhere else and do it. And it, it's, it is, it does come to that point where you all kind of, again, it's that compromise. You do, you do reach a point where your children want to meet your needs as much as you want to meet theirs. How old are your children? Uh, they are <laughs> you don't mean uh, Sorry. 11, 11 coming up 10 and 7 okay so three children okay three children yeah two boys okay. and a girl yeah um I just noticed because um Joe's asked what do you do if your needs aren't being met that's a hard one it's a really difficult one but see this, this, this isn't I've I've had lots of conversations with my two oldest boys this week uh, who have fallen out of their friends periodically over over playing Fortnite or whatever it is that they do talk playing with their friends online and i've talked about the fact that you cannot control other people whether that is your children your parents your friends people in the street whoever but what you can do is control yourself so if there is a point where you are being triggered there are if it's auditory, for example, there are things that you can do to help minimise the impact of those auditory triggers. If it's tactile, there are things that you can do to minimise. That's not to say that they will be gone completely, but you can minimise it. And obviously it's things like taking breaks, looking after your own sensory needs when the child is not around you. And those kind of things can help with that. But you are at some point going to be looking at burnout and that's that's obviously a really different and when you are in burnout obviously your sensory extremes become even more extreme um which makes these things even more difficult to deal with and it's it is this this is this is the problem you know there's like when we are not prepared no human is prepared for parenting not really you know we are we have these concepts of what our children will be like we will, will have these wonderful bundles of joy that will sleep all night they won't scream they'll eat anything you put in front of them they'll grow up and get great jobs and they'll be married and they'll have their own shit and it's not like that at all there's no reality we're not we are not prepared for the reality of having disabled children which everybody should be um as autistic people we are not prepared for the realities of having a small human being in our lives that is going to irritate the life out of us and also interrupt all of our routines and also it's going, it's going to trigger us sensorially as well we are not prepared for those facts and if there are autistic people out there listening i would say think really really carefully about that fact because if you're not ready for those things your experience of being a parent can go downhill very very quickly and you can you know it can get to the extremes where you start to resent your children and I've been there, you know, there have been points where I've been there where it's just been too much. And luckily, my wife and I have a very strong relationship where if one of us needs to go, they go, you know, and the other one's kind of left to deal with it. But we know that we take it in turns with it to a degree. And it, it is about kind of moderating your needs as best as is humanly possible. And maybe that's the, the easiest way of doing it. Well, and I think Jay's just put 100 percent here and I'm not sure because it's difficult to know whether that's from literally what you just said or like three four minutes to be fair i talk i monologue for like three or four minutes at a time so i'm fully aware of that so it couldn't she could just be yeah everything. i mean hopefully um <laughs> what have i got left uh well that actually just answered or went on to answer the um what advice do you have on how to manage overwhelmed triggers from your own family and children so that actually um was yeah. good you've done that bit which is fantastic um, this is an interesting one. Did you attempt to parent in a traditional way, in like a, a non-autistic expected way at any point? Um, Did you abandon that quite quickly? 
I don't think I ever did. I don't, I'm quite, um, I'm quite anarchic, what's, I can't get the word out, anarchical, I'm an anarchist. So kind of, I kind of resent social norms anyway, that's fundamentally at the heart of me. Um, so when it comes to kind of traditional parenting, no, I've always been very much an advocate of, you know, my wife was brought up Catholic, she won't mind me saying this, she was brought up Catholic, she's, she was brought up in a very kind of, you know, this, this is, this is how children behave, they should be in the corner and seen and not heard and all of that kind of stuff and that's how she was brought up. Um, she's got her own issues to do with regarding that but when it comes to parenting she very much tried to be like that and she was an only child as well and we had three children in quick succession so that was all kind of new to her so a lot of I think a lot of that was about control and about her need to kind of control what was going on and her need to conform with what other people expected of her whereas I was like nah, let him get on with it <laughs> um, you know but, but the only thing that has always been really really quite rigid in our household is bedtime in that they the, they go to bed later now than when they were younger but bedtime always started at a certain time it always involved the same routine and i think that helped them because none of them were bad sleepers although my oldest he's adhd as well and it's kind of he would he's like you know how a dog settles down before it goes to sleep it turns and turns and turns and turns he would do that for like an hour um, just literally crawling around in the bed going round and round and round and round but that was part of his routine in getting himself ready for sleep so having that routine was really important so so to a degree yes you could say that that's a that's a kind of normal parenting kind of tool but for the rest of it no we when you are say that, it does sound like a quite a nice autistic thing when you need be. that structure and that yeah routine. I mean I guess I guess so but then you know but all kids need structure to a degree they all need boundaries to a yes. degree as well and I think that's really important as a parent to have those things in place but you know we kind of Quinn again my oldest he um he swears he swears when he gets angsty now he melts down a lot less now as an 11 year old than he did when he was younger and I really think part of that is the fact that he uses swear words to get his angst out you know, he doesn't swear all the time. It's not like an offhand thing, but it's like I'm blind in the, and it comes out of him. And we don't police him for that because that's his way of getting. You can literally see the physicality of this angst coming out of him with these swear words. Um, so things like that around around kind of swearing, and I've always been very relaxed around things like tablets and stuff like that. Meal times we do eat together, but quite often there's five of us having five completely different meals. <laughs> you know so it's hard to be rigid around those kind of things and ideas and so no and my wife kind of relaxed into it quite quickly when she realized that they weren't going to die if they climbed on a climbing frame or you know all, all of those kind of things so no it's so no it's kind of very much and even school I'm not pressured about academia in terms of my children I just want them to be happy their mental health comes before anything for me even before their education and there's and so much you know I mean Harry gets asked because I, I I don't typically deal well it's just it's the way that my sort of um professional life has gone I guess is that I I typically get adolescents and older and, and yeah. he's obviously done a lot of work with parents and children mm -hmm. and just the question of like how do I get them to do x y and z for the GCDs yeah. and things like this and and yeah, it's it's not that important. And no. if they're really going to be interested in anything, they'll do it later. I did. I didn't this, go this, to this. This, this is my the thing. And things until I was in my twenties. We are. When I was it, it's it's. <laughs> if Christy Forbes is watching this, she's going to slap me because we have this conversation over and over. You can't talk about autism without talking about capitalism. Um, capitalism has socially conditioned us into understanding that we need to finish school at 16 go to college go to university get a good job have children who then will fulfill the same prophecy that you've just kind of lived yourself and that's rubbish because how many people reach their 40s and have a complete career change how many people i still don't know what i want to do with my life I've never known what I wanted to do in my life. And I still, and in, you know, in reality, I'm living it now. Being able, being able to talk about autism is now I've got to this point. I know that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life and what I have been doing for a long time. But it, it's, I never made an active choice that that's one to do. I never wanted to be a policeman and then went and came, became a policeman. If a child it's has that need, yeah. And if a child has that need, then that's brilliant. Support that. But most kids don't really know what they want to do. And most kids are living up to the expectations of everybody else around them. 
So, you know, that you are told that you have to figure out what you're going to do. And if you don't go to university, you can go to university when you're 25 or when you're 45. I know someone in their 60s is at yeah. university right now, you know. Or, so or it's never, it's not, that, and that's the not thing. Important. It's not important, yeah. yeah. Because cause, cause I do say that thing of like, say, you know, I didn't do my A-levels until I was in, uh, well, I only did one in the end in my 20s out of an interest for myself. Yeah. I wanted to know more about psychology and things. And then I went to uni, but you don't even have to do that either. No. That's that's the thing. It's it's yeah. Learn about life in in your way, I guess. And um, it's, it's interesting because there's a, I think um, it was Monique Botha's research. Um, she came up with a statistic that there are more autistic people with PhDs than actually have A to C's in their GCSEs. And it's sorry, really say interesting. That, sorry, say that again. So there's it's more... something like there are more autistic people with PhDs than there are with GCSEs from A to C. So as, as, in, some, like as, as in there are more PhD, people, but not got the GCSEs. Not got the GCSEs to, that you would assume that would be matched with it. And that's because, yeah, PhD, PhD is loose research. You can special interest. You can hyper focus on a particular subject and research the life out of it. G, GCSEs are 11 random subjects where you are forced to learn what you what well, they think that. you need I to hope, know. I'm going to say this and I hope no... Um, uh, nobody who I ever want to employ me in academia sees this but I got a D in maths and I now have a PhD where I've had to do advanced statistics <laughs> so those GCSEs really didn't mean it shows how meaningless it is though doesn't it diddly squat basically yeah, it does um yeah but so... even university university used to be about learning but now it's a route into a job that's not learning yeah, whereas I'm, I don't want, a, I don't want a job. No. Do you know what I mean? I want, yeah, for me, it has been about, although I say I'm interested in obviously learning and all that, but I'm also much, very much about applied. Like I don't, for me personally, I don't see the point in doing research for research sake. It has no. to mean Have something. a purpose, yeah. It has to help, for me anyway, yeah. I'm a social psychologist. So, you know, you were saying earlier on about people, you know, don't take enough um, into account about sociology if they're yeah. focusing on psychology. Well, I was, do. psychology was too, too particular for me as well, even though it's, it's very, very varied. Um, sociology was also too particular for me as mm. well, but social psychology. So I kind of like was trying to cross, manage to have, cross narratives. Have, have the two. Um, where have I got to? Da, da, da. The traditional way. Okay. Um, I think, I don't know whether to finish one on this one or not. I just wanted to know about the fact that that it was Simon Baron Cohen who spent a day with Simon Baron Cohen for your assessment. I find that quite interesting. <laughs> um, so for those who are perhaps not aware, um, so Simon Baron Cohen is actually um, the cousin of Sasha Baron Cohen, who plays Ali G, Ali G. And sometimes I confuse the two. And I'm talking about you know the autism research of Sasha Baron Cohen. Um, but Simon Baron Cohen is arguably uh, contributed to the issue that people believe autism is a male thing yes. or a male brained um, uh, disorder, basically. So yeah, so I find that quite interesting mm -hmm. that you spent a day with him. <laughs> I find it quite interesting that you mentioned Sasha Baron Cohen because I walked into Simon, Bar I walked out of Simon Baron Cohen's office and shouted out, is it because I is autistic? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he did no. not laugh. He did not laugh. And I was furious that he did not laugh. But obviously he must have heard that about a hundred times before. Oh, but I literally, I walked into the, 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 it's, it's a place in a, it's, he's, he's, uh, I don't know if he's still there, but it was in a place called Trumpington in Cambridge, which already had me in fits of the giggles the whole time I was there. And, um, but you know, I walk, literally walked into this building, and I just envisioned him coming out with this like huge gold chain around his neck and a beanie cap on and stuff. And, and but obviously he didn't. But that's how I saw him the whole day. He was the, the literally he was sat there wearing that tracksuit and. Oh, in your head he was. In my head. Oh yeah, not literally, but in my head he absolutely was, which made it really hard to talk to him because I kept trying not to laugh. And how was the process? Because like you said, it was it was different then because obviously yeah. now. Although arguably now it's um, the assessment is is problematic for adults because it's still based on a child. Yeah, I think actually 
as a diagnostic experience, it was nearer to what it should be than it is now because it was a long conversation. It was, he, I mean, he, he prompted, he asked questions, obviously. Um, but it was more of about, you know, did you find you did this when you were a child? No, but I did this. And it was kind of, so he, he, would, he would set things up and it would trigger things for me. And it was actually a really useful experience for me. And I, I struggle so much because my, my, the actual experience of the day, although I came away and it was meaningless really for me at that point, the actual experience of the day was really interesting for me and it was a really nice day. Um, and we talked about hard things, obviously, but it was the whole, the overall overriding experience was that I spent a day in an office with a, a, actually a really interesting person, um, which was a good thing for me. So coming away and learning about the narratives that he has contributed to was actually quite a, I didn't know how to kind of conflate that in my head. I was going to say, it sounds like you'd be a little bit conflicted. I was because I liked him and that's the, and he was, he's so autistic. He's the most autistic man I've ever met in my entire life. Um, and and is that said much elsewhere? Because I, I say this behind closed doors that, that surely he's an autistic individual. Well, I mean, to be fair, how many people who work within the autism industry aren't autistic and don't know about it? And that's, you know, it's, you're looking at a lot, especially people drawn to psychology. Most people who are drawn to psychology are autistic because they are there because they want to figure themselves out. Or, that's or, exactly yeah, why. Yeah, or there. have their own mental health. Um, exactly. To understand yeah. themselves. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's 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 and anybody that's anybody that says otherwise is lying or masking, <laughs> or both. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of it was a real it was a real conflict because I did genuinely like him, and then finding out that he had contributed to this narrative that. A lot, you know, to put it bluntly, a lot of autistic women have unnecessarily killed themselves because of the narratives that he's contributed to, because they've gone undiagnosed, they've been misdiagnosed because of this whole extreme male brain thing and the whole empathy thing that comes off the back of that as well. And it, it's this is where we have these famous, you know, autism academics Um, you know, him, Uta Frith, um, I don't know, Tony Atwood, all these people who are really problematic in a lot of ways, but they're not seen as problematic by people outside of the narrative. And that's really difficult because they are the ones who contribute constantly to government policy, to charities, to, and the things that they say get taken as verbatim because they have this kudos. And it, it's, and it's the same with research. research. A lot of academics seem to think that their research exists in a vacuum, and it doesn't because a research paper is put out, it's picked up by the media, it's, it delves its way into societal and societal thinking, which feeds itself back into professional thinking. And this is where all these myths come from and all these misconceptions. And I get frustrated because people will say, well, it passed an ethics board, so it can't have been harmful and, and all this kind of thing. But there's a difference between micro ethics, mm -hmm. so passing an ethics board means things like we'll do no um, psychological or physical harm during that during study. That, yeah. Kind of thing. But that's ignoring macro ethics mm. or ethical considerations, which is what I do in this research and what I find and what I then say about what I found, how will that impact yeah. human beings outside of a lab? And sadly that is not considered by an ethics board. No. And that's one of the most important things. Is this piece of research that I'm doing going to harm people in some way um, out in, in, in the grander scheme of things in terms of the community and what have you? Um, I don't wanna finish on a sad note. No. So, but, uh, but no, no, that's interesting. Like you say, uh, I think uh, grabbing onto what you said, which is that it was a better, way for maybe later diagnosed autistic individuals which is to have an in-depth conversation and feel seen and heard it was validating that was that was the thing it was really really validating in that there was someone there and this 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 is why you know beyond the obvious signs of him being autistic um, which he is not i have diagnosed him myself um, and i'm not a diagnostician but it was he intuitively got what i was saying and it wasn't that he recognised it because he'd heard other people talking about it. I could see that he actually intuitively understood that. And that's and why... That's the thing. It's not possible for a non-autistic person... To get that. To truly empathise with autistic. No, 
experience. No. So yeah, that's in that in itself would be elucidating. That's, uh, that's yeah. I think it's really important. Um, Sarah Hendricks, she she does kind of pre-diagnostic talks with people to kind of walk them through the process and talk to them and help them to build up a kind of uh, an evidence base for when they actually do go through the diagnostic criteria and that's something that I've started doing with people as well to help not to not to coach them through it but because when you go to these appointments and you get asked the, you know what did you do on the 5th of June when you were three and I don't know you know uh, you know your mind goes back especially if you're autistic and you verbal shutdown and anxiety and all those things kick in and it, it's kind of it's important that you have this evidence base to go to your to go to your go through your diagnostic process with before you get there. We because like I say, with our program, we do call it a pre and post diagnostic mm. program um, because some people won't even seek a diagnosis. And it's not about that. It's actually about them understanding themselves Being and validated. Yeah. People. But we do like I say we tend me personally out of like a sort of ethical consideration we don't describe in detail the li likely um way the assessment will be done yeah. um we mentioned that there's going to be a book that they're going to ask you to to um interpret and all this kind of thing but mm -hmm. yes yeah, so we don't give them lots and lots of details because i just think that yeah you you might play up to it yeah. even if you don't mean to um but we definitely do the same thing which is um you know, we tell them to keep a sense diary and we tell people to um, just start writing down ideas about anything. Don't yeah. don't think about what makes you autistic because that's yeah. quite difficult. We just and, and so I say, you know, when I went for my diagnosis, I'd already started compiling. It ended up being about 13 pages long about who I was. And, you know, and those were autistic things because yeah. I'm autistic mm -hmm. and I took them in. And what's interesting is. For the assessment yours sounded like it would have been better i would have enjoyed it to some extent whereas the assessment that obviously we get is um the informants that they call them um which is typically your parents um but for me that wasn't possible so it was um the best friend i had at the time and my ex who was my friend um because i'd lived with him for seven years so he knew mm. me quite well so they were my informants and they were told that independently they would probably be interviewed for about three hours each about who I was and all this kind of stuff. And then I was told when I come in, um, my assessment part was going to be 45 minutes. I was like, no, 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 no. You are going to spend ages being talked at <laughs> because I, I, I needed to, you know, that was my- You needed to offload. Right yeah. at the beginning of my journey. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, what you're describing is a much better way and and what i want to describe in the chapter that i'm doing for um damien milton is um actually how i think programs like our sya program doesn't have to be our sya program but obviously i'd like it to be mm -hmm. would actually make a better diagnostic tool yeah because you're helping people articulate their experiences and things and we spend a lot of time with these people nobody ever comes to us like the last program run that we did we had eight students and only one of them was diagnosed nobody comes to us if they're not autistic no nobody comes through our program you know and they're not autistic and we know as well so you know and and we can we're better placed to then say right well this particular person does this 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 and this and this and this yeah. and this that's clearly why they're autistic kind of thing and then at the end they get their um uh which is which they like much better than uh, a diagnosis which is their um congratulations <laughs> and welcome I've to the autistic this. community uh -huh. well, th th that's how it should be though it should be this amazing amazing experience I mean, my daughter when she when she got diagnosed um she wanted an autism party because she was so happy that she was like her brother, she was like her dad, and that, that someone had said, yes, you are officially like them. And that's, you know, she was six years old and that's that's her first beginnings in really kind of understanding herself is that it was a positive experience yeah. and that's what it should be. It should be a positive learning experience. And it should be ideally you finding out and understanding and discovering that when you're in a relatively good place. Yeah. Now, that's not always going to be possible, 
but because Harry's talked about this a lot, which is that unfortunately a lot of people get diagnosed because they're at their lowest. Yeah. And then you tie your diagnosis to, to that negative a experience. very negative yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. And you kind of ignore when you're having a good day or, or what have you, that's also you being autistic. Yeah. And that that's good and that's mm-hmm. positive. Yeah. So, yeah. But we can, we can do this. We can do this together. And that's why, obviously, I love having these conversations. There's so many amazing autistic people to talk to. There are. I'm trying to scoop them all and have these conversations. <laughs> um, I mean, I'd love it if at any point um, there's other things that you'd be willing to discuss with us. Sure. I'm actually made a note about the selective mutism. Okay. Because, um, obviously, the students that, I've supported sometimes we get things that I haven't supported before so we had um when you brought up about alexithymia had a a really lovely student um last year who whose alexithymia was quite extreme um and supporting him we had to do it differently you know Mm. had and, and it was fantastic he was really really lovely um and then I had another student with selective mutism and I had to look into it to be able to then help guide yeah. them. But actually, I think that's something quite important to talk about. I think about it's really important. Because it's fascinating that there is that mechanical inability to talk. Yeah. And it's not, it's just not, it's not just a psychological thing. No, 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 no. It's a physical stopping of it. And that's the that's Yes. The, Which and the... I've not experienced that. So I think that would be really important. Like I'd love it if my student, I've got a couple of students actually with selective mutism. Um to, to learn about that from somebody as opposed to a paper or something <laughs> along those lines. Or a um, textbook. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I hope everybody's got something out of that. Um, there's been some lovely comments, I'm sure. And I, I think Harry's been um, fielding stuff for <laughs> us, which has been good, but I'm going to, I'll have a look over the next day or so. Okay. Um, but this has been great. Thank you so much. For no, it's been a pleasure. Honestly. Over on Academy. Um, I'm going to stop the live um, if I remember how to do that. But yes, thank you everybody who was listening. Thank you. Um, This has been Kieran Rose of The Autistic Advocate.